Well, I invite your attention back to the Gospel of Mark. We are still in chapter 1 as we are beginning a series through Mark's Gospel. And today we are going to see the authority of Jesus Christ. And as you think of that word authority, a number of connotations may come to mind, and some of them may not necessarily be positive connotations, I realize that. But I want to share with you an encounter, an observation I had several years ago when our our family was living in Greece. And so I know this is a, a kids, a family worship Sunday, so kids, what I'm about to share with you, I'm not recommending, okay? I just want to use it as an example of something that I witnessed, uh, and it relates to authority. It was on a a particular school day that I I looked over at the middle school, which was just behind the little duplex that we lived in, and I noticed that there were a lot of people at the gate of the school. They locked it up every night. And uh, uh, over the, the gate, there was a sign that said catalepsy, which means captured. And there were students on the inside And there were administrators and teachers on the outside. And the students got there early. They brought a chain and a padlock, and they locked the gate. And they said, we have captured the school. And what I witnessed was some type of a bartering, not bartering, a a negotiation happening. They had had some, some issues that they wanted to share, and they wanted to share these concerns. And so back and forth, you had administrators. I saw some parents that I knew that were at the gate on the outside. I think I saw the mayor there, and they were going back and forth. And, and I, I drove by several times. I was like, what is this? It's like the classic inmates running the asylum thing, right? What is, what is going on with, with this school locked up? And, and so, uh, you know, I'm coming from America, and so in my mind, I'm thinking, no, we could solve this pretty quickly, right? I mean, th- this, this doesn't even have to last even a few more minutes, right? This could, be, this could be resolved. And so I was talking to some of my neighbors about it, and they said, well, it's because you don't understand what's happening. This goes back a few years. In 1973, there was a military dictator in charge, a junta that was in charge of of Greece. And uh, he had been known for his authoritarianism, and he was very harsh. And so uh, what happened in November of 1973 is some students at a university campus decided they would have a protest against the military dictator. And he was offended by it, and he decided he would quell the uprising. And so what he did is he sent the military to the front gate of the university, which they also had a sign that said they had, they had uh, captured it, and they had, they had concerns about the dictator. And uh, if you remember, or you look back and read the history, he actually sent a tank. There's a face-off of a tank and a gate. It kind of reminds me of like a Tiananmen Square type of a situation. And he ordered the tank to go across the gate. And there were students on that gate, and they got crushed, and they died. And in total, like 24 people died in that uprising. Now, he didn't last much longer. The country of Greece erupted, and they overthrew this dictator and reestablished more of a democratic uh, situation once again. But I didn't have that context, right? And so thinking about authority from culture to culture, from situation to situation, you may have different thoughts. Now, in that case, I would say, and I just want to be clear to the students who are present, that was an overreach, right, to, to, to lock out the middle school teachers. We're not going for that around here. That's not what I'm recommending. But it, it is a, an example of saying there are some that, that can demonstrate a lack of a respect for authority, a proper respect. There are some that can overuse or abuse authority. And so when we touch that word, that topic of authority, it can be, it can be considered from a lot of different perspectives, even in our culture, as we think of what, uh, of what takes place related to authority. Maybe you're thinking about the workplace. Maybe you're thinking about, about uh, government leaders. Maybe you can think of your own examples of where you've seen authority either rightly or wrongly used. But as I was working on the message this week, I came across Someone who said there are actually personal sources of authority that that sometimes we we lean on and we may not even realize that they are authoritative. Let me just give you a brief list. The first one is reason. Someone that says, I live the way I live because I think. Reasoning. Reason can be a source of authority. Others might say it's experience. I live the way I live live because of how I feel. And I think you could, you could see examples of that, that, that people go on not what they're thinking, but what they're feeling, that that can serve as an authority. Others might view tradition. 
as authoritative. I live the way I live because we have always, what does it say? Done it this way. Ever found yourself saying that or hearing others say that? That tradition can be authoritative. But then there is revelation. I live the way I live because of what? God's authority. And we are thinking about the authority of God today, the authority of Jesus Christ, the authority of the Word of God. And so we, we ask ourselves, in situations, are we allowing some of these other sources to supersede the authority of God, of His Word in our lives? We're going to be looking at this message today. I've titled it Absolute Authority because the type of authority Jesus demonstrates in Mark chapter 1 is unparalleled. It's unlike any other authority that we could see in this world. We're going to see it in a, in a few different settings. And by the way, everything that we're going to be looking at this morning happens in a single day of ministry for Jesus. So I think you'll find that interesting. I also want to uh, take some time to emphasize his authority because I think the cultural understanding of Christ typically emphasizes things like compassion, grace, mercy, love, attributes that all of us would say, amen, amen, amen. But is that a complete description of Jesus? Because as we will see today, he is a mighty, powerful God. He is a king of kings. He is a Lord, a sovereign Lord. In fact, I had a friend one time, we were serving uh, in a mission project together, and over and over again, he kept saying, God is large and in charge. And uh, I thought, you know, he is right. He, we serve a big God, and, and he is in charge. This is all up to him. And so, so we're thinking about the authority. And, and yes, we consider those other attributes, but let's not forget that we serve a mighty, mighty Savior. In fact, that's part of what we were even singing about here this morning. We're going to see the absolute authority of Jesus in three realms, the spiritual realm, the supernatural realm, and the natural realm. So with that in mind, let's look and pick back up where we left off last week. Mark 1, verse 21. They went into Capernaum. Now, this is speaking of Jesus with four disciples, Simon Peter, his brother Andrew, and James and John. We met them last week. It says, right away he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and began to teach. They were astonished at his teaching. Because he was teaching them as one who had authority and not like the scribes. So we see, first of all, that this is the spiritual realm. Jesus is demonstrating authority as a teacher, a spiritual teacher. Now, we have the, the four disciples with him so far, Simon Peter, Andrew, James, and John. They're in Capernaum, which is located on the north side of the Sea of Galilee. And so this is a town, Capernaum. It comes from a Hebrew word, kephar, meaning village. It literally means village of Nahum and uh, Capernaum. Jesus begins his teaching ministry there. Now notice he's not at the temple in Jerusalem. He's not in a, in a, in, in a capital city. He is in a village known as Capernaum, near the Sea of Galilee, a place where the, the fishermen worked, right? He's, he is approaching, he is beginning, I should say, his teaching ministry with the common everyday folk. And that's where he shows up to their synagogue. Now, notice that Mark in these verses didn't tell us the content of his teaching. Mark is focusing on the one who is teaching and the response, the fact that he is authoritative. And so, as we think about this, the person of Jesus is more important than the subject of his teaching, or as we might even think of, he is the subject of the teaching. Verse 22 says that those present were astonished. They were amazed, and uh, they noticed a difference in comparing him to what was typically taught. They, they mentioned scribes. Now, when we think of a scribe, we're probably thinking of someone that just writes things down or maybe was a copyist. But, but in this occasion, a scribe would have been a teacher of the word, of the law. A scribe would have been an interpreter of the law. And so they would have been highly regarded. And yet, no comparison between the scribe and Jesus. A scribe would have even functioned in some cases like a civil attorney to say this is how we apply 
this part of the law to this situation in, in, uh, uh, that, that's, that's at hand. And so they would have been respected, and yet they're, they, as a congregation, are noticing a difference. In fact, the word that Mark uses is exousia, to speak of the authority of Jesus being unlike any other. In fact, the Apostle Paul really describes the uh, authority of Jesus really well in the book of Philippians. In chapter 2, verse 9, he says, For this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. A powerful description of the absolute authority of Jesus Christ. Let us catch a glimpse of that today. Jesus went to Capernaum demonstrating an authority like no one else. And remember, at this point in the narrative, what has he done? He's only taught. He hadn't performed a miracle yet. He hadn't cast out a demon yet. All he's done is teach, and people are already amazed and astonished simply by his teaching. Let's keep reading. Look down at verse 23. It says, Just then, a man with an unclean spirit was in their synagogue. He cried out, What do you have to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us, I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Now, Jesus was teaching, and now we have a man with an unclean spirit. Now, th this is like an ultimate sermon illustration right here, okay? I mean, th this, is, this, is, this is powerful. Jesus is going to begin to demonstrate that his authority is not just the spiritual authority as a teacher, but the supernatural authority as well, because here we're going to see him as a deliverer. And again, where is this man? Where's he at? He's in the synagogue, right? He's in, he's in the place of worship, and yet he has an unclean spirit. If you remember last week, we were with Jesus in the wilderness, and he was tempted. He overcame the temptation, but it was a picture that the kingdom of God was being assaulted by the dominion of an adversary. The Bible refers to him as the devil, as Satan, as, uh, as this, this one that is coming against Christ. Now, in verse 23 of our text, it says this man had an unclean spirit. And so as you read that phrase that is really a synonym with demon, or maybe in this case, demons plural, because if you see what was said, he used the word in a, in a plural sense. Uh, what have, he uses the word us in this. Now, you might be asking, well, what is an unclean spirit? What is a demon? And as, as, you, as you look to the Word of God, you recall that, that Satan is identified, that he was one who had an insurrection uh, against, against the authority of God, and that a number of angels were a part of that. They're referred to as fallen angels. Do you remember what the percentage was of all of the angelic beings, how many were part of the insurrection? It was a third. And so we don't have specific numbers, but we know that it was, it was a, a, a significant percentage. And so they were, they were, of course, removed from the presence of God. And for a time, they've been given a place on earth. We, we, we can look and we can see God's good creation. We can find evidence of, of his love. We can find evidence of his, of his beauty. But we also don't have to look very far to see evidence of, of evil, the presence of evil. In fact, uh, at times, even as we look at the society around us, we can say this this is something that's evil. This is heinous. This is, this is not of the Lord. So, so we can recognize both good and and evil. Now, these fallen angels or unclean spirits or demons, they continue to strive against the kingdom of God. We know that there is an opposing force to the Lord's work. Now, they aren't omnipotent, but they do bring about havoc and division, strongholds, 
We know that there is a power that's at work. In fact, Ephesians 6 describes it this way. Finally, be strengthened by the Lord and by his vast strength. Put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the what? The schemes of the devil. Now, now I know some people say, now look, you know, you... You don't want to be looked at as an extremist. You don't want to find a devil behind it or a demon behind every bush, right? I, I recognize that. I know that we are fallen people, and at times it's just the carnal nature, the fleshly nature that is, that is at work and that tempts us and so forth. But I also don't want to discount what the Word of God says because we're being told here to, to prepare, right? We're being told to to be on guard so that we can stand firm. Let's keep reading Ephesians 6. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this darkness, against evil spiritual forces in the heavens. So church family, let us not be lulled into sleep. And to think that there isn't a cosmic battle between good and evil out there happening. We can look throughout history and find examples of death and destruction. We can find examples of deception. We can see the reordering or the redefining of of God's created intended purposes, even for people. I agree with what our Disciple Now speaker said uh, several weeks ago that That the doctrine of anthropology, what what is people? How are people defined in the Word of God? That That is a pressing one for us today. And so all of this, when it gets redefined, when it gets put in a different light, is a battle of truth versus lies. Even today, when the authority of Jesus Christ is proclaimed, you can see resistance. In fact, go to the public square and talk about any any spiritual belief you want. You know, you can hear people talking about Kabbalah or Scientology out of Hollywood, right? And, and, oh, they're they're viewed as spiritual people. But, but boy, let one of them talk about about being redeemed by Jesus Christ and having him as, uh, as their authority. Wow, that's a whole other response, right? We see it. Now, can you imagine being in Capernaum? Back to Mark 1 being a part of the congregation that was first astonished by the teaching of Christ and said, that is authoritative, but now they are witnessing an unclean spirit that is speaking to him. Let's see what Jesus does. Look down at verse 25. Jesus rebuked him, saying, be silent, literally be muzzled, and come out of him. And the unclean spirit threw him into convulsions, shouted with a loud voice, and came out of him. So again, very dramatic picture here of, of, of Christ's authority. This man that, uh, that was possessed by demons is now clean. Now there were convulsions. I'm sure he fell to the ground. And yet now he's being made new. Now he is being set free from the bondage that had held him for so long. So yes, we see the authority of Christ not just to, to, to dispel the demonic influence, but we also see the authority of Christ in bringing about something new, the man able to stand up, I'm sure, in his right mind once again. I like how one of the commentators I read explained this scene. James Edwards said, not only are unclean spirits expelled, but broken people are restored to health and wholeness and to the possibility of restoration with their creator, in whose image they are made. The exousia, the authority of Jesus is astonishing, not as a display of Jesus' grandeur, but as a power of redemption for captives. This man had been set free. And maybe to some degree, you can relate to that. You can remember what it was like being held to the, the penalty of sin, the bondage of sin being held to the thinking of, of the age, all of those things that, that, that happen when one is not in Christ and you can reflect on being set free, being made new. Well, this encounter 
in the uh, synagogue, of course, was quite d- dramatic and no doubt had an effect on the congregation. So let's, let's read what that was. Look down at verse 27. They were all amazed. And so they began to ask each other, what is this? What a good question. What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once, the news about him spread throughout the entire vicinity of Galilee. Before we go any further in this passage, I just want to point something out. In Jesus, there is hope for anyone, anyone. I know sometimes we may look at someone and say, oh, they've rejected so many times. They've mocked God. Maybe maybe they're just too far gone. Have you ever had that thought? Well, look at what Jesus did with a man that many probably would have thought was too far gone. Even the presence of demons speaking through him. But the Lord has a greater authority, and he set that man free. And so I just want us to reflect on that passage, even in a day like today. Maybe there is someone that you think is too far gone, and yet it's in situations like that, friends, that Jesus can do his very best work, right? And maybe some of you have testimonies of that. I came across something called when you are. It says, when you are the neediest, he is the most sufficient. When you are completely helpless, he is most helpful. When you feel totally dependent, he is absolutely dependable. When you are the weakest, he is the most able. When you are the most alone, he is intimately present. When you feel the most useless, he is preparing you. When it is the darkest, he is the only light you need. When you feel the least secure, he is your rock and fortress. And I like the way it ends. When you can't, he can. This is our Lord, our authoritative yet compassionate Lord doing his work as only he can. Yes, friends, there is true hope in Jesus. He is more than a message. He is the message, right? He is the authority. And when he enters someone's life, he has the ability to make them brand new. Well, as we continue reading in Mark 1, we see that Mark emphasizes the authority of Jesus one more time. But this time he does so as it is coupled with tender compassion. Let's jump back down to verse 29. It says, As soon as they left the synagogue, they went into Simon and Andrew's house with James and John. Simon's mother-in-law was lying in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. So he went to her, took her by the hand, and raised her up. The fever left her, and she began to serve them. Well, we've seen the spiritual realm, the supernatural realm. Well, now we're in the natural realm, the authority that he demonstrates as a healer. Now, again, I want to remind you, verses 21 to 34, one single day of ministry for Jesus, right? One account after another. And in each case, he's exhibiting his authority. Now, Simon Peter and his brother Andrew, they were from Capernaum. They took Jesus to his home, and sure enough, Peter's mother-in-law was there, and her fever had her so sick that she was in bed. And so we see the authority of Jesus once again, this time over physical illness. But don't we also see the compassion of Jesus in this passage and the way in which he healed her? Look, I mean, there were times where Jesus just healed by saying something, right? Even from a distance. But not this time. You see the tender compassion. He even, the text tells us, right? Verse 31, I think, that he reached out and grabbed her hand. And you just see the the tender side of a shepherd caring, caring for his own. He took this sick woman by the hand. He lifted her up. And I think it's a fitting picture even for us today. When we're praying and we're asking the Lord to intervene, that that we remember that he is a good shepherd. He is one who loves. Yes, authoritative, powerful, mighty, all of those things. But he's also very, very compassionate. Now, I want to point out that physical healing of illness does not always occur. 
So we don't want to misunderstand that. We should pray for it. And on occasion, we will see examples of Jesus healing a physical infirmity or a disease. In fact, every Tuesday at 2 o'clock, when the church staff of Fellowship of Wildwood get together, we have a prayer time. A good number of what we're praying about are physical needs, physical illness, surgeries, all kinds of... We, we should pray for those things. And at times, we will see that God chooses to work in ways that can confound even, even, even doctors, right? But it's not a promise. It's not a reflection on whether someone has enough faith, which is sometimes erroneously spoken of. Sometimes God's will and His plan is not to provide physical healing in this earth. Sometimes that healing comes outside as He calls someone into eternity. At times, the Lord allows people to live with infirmity and sickness. I'm reminded even the Apostle Paul, we're not exactly sure what the thorn in the flesh was, but he said he prayed how many times for it to be removed? Multiple times, three times. And what did he get? He got the response, my grace is sufficient for you. So we don't always know. We don't always know. But in this case, he did decide to heal. And it says in verse 31, the fever left her and that she was up and began serving those who were present. The healing was immediate. Her strength was immediately restored to her to the point that she was able just to get up and start serving those who were present. Now, I, I don't think her response is one of duty. I think it's one of gratitude. I think she was so grateful that she had been restored and healed from this fever that she was ready to, uh, to serve. And as I think about that, if you've been touched by Christ, if you've been a recipient of His compassion and grace, have you ever felt that urge, that desire that you want to serve? You've been a recipient of His grace and you want to extend it to others. I, I think we're seeing a picture of that here in Peter's mother-in-law. But today I want to give another example. I want to, to share with you about uh, a man who really is being celebrated today. Can you guess who that is? Those wearing green can tell us that it is Patrick, St. Patrick, right? And so uh, you may have been thinking about that. Well, let me share with you a little bit about St. Patrick. Many are caught up in the festivities of the day, and you may be wondering, well, what kind of guy was he? It's worth remembering that the life of, of Patrick as being one who was a recipient of God's grace. In fact, he longed to share this with others. Um, he was born in Britain in the year 387. During a time of great uncertainty for the Roman Empire, typically they provided some protection along the coastline of Britain, but many of their forces were taken to another part of the empire and invaders uh, came in. Uh, in fact, the invaders uh, were called uh, Irish pirates, if you think of it that way. Now, just before Patrick was 16 years old, he and his family were in a small town near the sea, and these Irish pirates attacked Many people were taken captive, including 15-year-old Patrick. He was taken across the waters into Ireland, and he was sold into slavery uh, to a Druid tribal chief and priest named Milhu. Patrick was given the task of being a herdsman. He was uh, uh, there watching over uh, a flock, watching over animals, as was given to him. But as, his, as he was reflecting at that point in his life, he was not a follower of Christ. Now, his, his dad had been a deacon in the church. His grandfather had been a minister of the gospel. But he had not yet made a personal commitment to Christ until then. As he was out working as a slave, watching over these herds. In his autobiography called Confessions, he wrote this. The Lord opened my senses to my unbelief so that I might remember my many sins and accordingly I might turn to the Lord my God with all my heart. So there's his conversion. He also wrote about his faith growing as he prayed to God while out in the fields. But after I had come to Ireland, it was then that I, may, I was made to shepherd the flocks day after day. And as I did so, I would pray all the time right through the day. More and more, the love of God and fear of Him grew strong within me. And as my faith grew, so the Spirit became more and more active within me. 
Isn't that encouraging as a teenager? Just to see that growth happening, the prayer, the commitment to the Lord. Well, his devotion to God didn't go unnoticed. Other slaves began calling him Holy Boy. And uh, that, was, uh, that was his title. Now, several years later, at the age of 22, he had a dream about going back to Britain, trying to find his family. And so uh, he escaped, traveled about 200 miles to the coast of Ireland, somehow managed to get across the waters, back to Britain, found his city, found his family, and he was reunited. As he was settling back into life there in Britain, he decided to study for the ministry. And one night, he had a dream of a man who seemed to be from Ireland. He was carrying a letter, and the letter on the outside said, The Voice of the Irish. And as he began to read the words, it was as if he could hear the voice of the same men that he worked with. It was like they were saying, Holy boy, we beg you, come back and walk once more among us. He woke, he woke up in this dream, really. Have you ever had a dream that just really kind of kind of startled you? Well, th this was Patrick. So he went and talked to his parents about it. He talked to the church leaders about it. He said, is, is this possibly a, a call for me to go back to Ireland? And you can think what his parents were thinking. No way, right? They took you as a slave. We don't want you to go back to the Druids. Those people aren't worth saving. That was kind of their, their thinking. They thought the thought of, the, of him returning back to barbaric Ireland with the gospel. Now, Tim, those are not my words. That's what was written here, barbaric Ireland. Accurate. Okay, all right. <laughs> but they, they were known, these Druids, to take runaway slaves, weave them into large wicker baskets, and hoist them over a fire. Yeah, so his parents were not all that excited about him returning. But even with this opposition, Patrick later wrote these words. So at last, I came here to the Irish Gentiles to preach the gospel. I am ready and willing to give up my own life without hesitation for his name. Now, folks, Patrick is an example of one who had a desire to serve the Lord. He had, he had been a recipient of God's grace, and he wanted to share that with others, like Peter's mother-in-law, ready to serve the Lord right after he had done this work in her life. Now, how the modern celebration of St. Patrick's Day is connected to a man like this, I have no idea. Some, someone else will have to answer that question. I don't know why we see what we see with, with the modern celebration when you look at a man like this. Well, let's wrap up. We're out of time. Mark chapter 1. Let's read the, uh, the last of this passage. We're wrapping up here the 24-hour uh, the day that we've been reading about. When evening came, after the sun had set, they brought to him all those who were sick and demon-possessed. The whole town was assembled at the door, and he healed many who were sick with various diseases and drove out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. Now talk about a long day. Jesus had started in the synagogue that morning teaching the word. He had cast out an unclean spirit. Then he went over to Peter's house and he healed Peter's mother-in-law. Now the whole city, it says, is gathered at the door. Those who were sick, those who were oppressed with demons, Jesus was healing many. The word was out and Jesus worked tirelessly with the crowd. Yes, he was exhibiting his authority, his divine strength. But what else is being displayed here? His compassion, his love. Now remember, in our first message in Mark, we said that Mark's gospel presented Jesus as a servant. Remember, specifically a suffering servant. And what have we read today? We have seen over and over again how Jesus was serving. He healed those who were sick. He cast out demons. The kingdom of God had arrived in the person of the great and awesome king who had absolute authority. His authority is unmatched, whether in the spiritual, supernatural, or natural realms. So here today, church family, in Mark chapter 1, we have seen that the Lord, indeed, not only is authoritative, but he cares about the problems in this fallen world. Yes, it was a normal day in the life of Jesus, but it was anything but normal for those who encountered and experienced his saving power. Before we wrap up with, with prayer and a closing song, 
I'd like for us to reflect on the passage that we read and, and see how might we apply the word today. Let's be, let's be hearers of the word, but let's also strive to be doers. And so here's a few questions to consider as we close. Number one, do you hold any other sources of authority above God's revelation? Remember that opening about the authority of reason or experience or tradition? At times, it may, it may compete with the authority of God's revelation. And so, so think about that. Think about the ordering of authority. Number two, how can you withstand the dominion of evil and darkness in this world? Can we stand? Can we stand in this age? How are we to stand? What are we to do? What do we read? To put on the full armor, right? Maybe each day that's part of our prayer. Lord, help me to put on the armor so that I can stand. Help me to put that armor on. Number three, is there someone that you think is too far gone for the Lord to redeem? Let's admit it. Sometimes we have people that we've prayed for for a long, long time, and we just don't see any movement there. But how does this passage encourage you to pray for them? God did some of his best work. The Lord did some of his best work setting people free, including this man with the unclean spirit. Let us pray and not, not grow weary. Number four, finally, do you have a sickness or possibly a hurt in need of the Lord's healing touch? And we know that, uh, that the Lord cares. We know the Lord is concerned. We know that at times the Lord will choose to heal in various ways. And yet, without being presumptuous, we still are called to pray. We're called to bring these needs before the Lord and to see how he can do a work in our lives. And maybe as we've reflected upon this passage today, something has come to mind that you could bring to him in prayer. Well, thank you for, uh, uh, for your attention this morning as we've gone through this passage. One day in the life of Jesus, a lot there to consider. But let's stand together. We're going to have a word of prayer, and then we'll have a closing song.